November 1558. Elizabeth comes to the throne of a relatively weak kingdom that is divided heavily on religious grounds between Protestants and Catholics. However, her steady and long reign of 44 years would begin England's path to be the dominant European power, usher in a golden age, and finally give stability for a group of Christians that would be the middle ground between Catholicism and Protestantism. In the 12 years since the death of King Henry VIII, the throne of England had seen two vastly different monarchs, the young Edward, a reform-minded Protestant, and his older sister Mary, a devout Catholic. Both had forced their nations and its church into great turmoil. In November 1558, Mary died. She left the throne to her younger half-sister Elizabeth. Elizabeth inherited a divided nation between those in favor of maintaining the Catholic faith and those supporting the reforms under her brother. Almost as soon as Elizabeth came back to power, the Protestant intelligentsia whom had fled to Europe started to return. As well, Protestants were put into positions within the Privy Council, the Queen's advisory group. The next year, in 1559, Parliament was resummoned so as to reach a settlement on the faith of the Church of England. Some historians disagree with the events of this faithful year. However, it appears that at first Elizabeth intended to find a way to reach a settlement on religious issues that would be favorable to both Catholics and Protestants. Unable to reach a broad agreement, she ended up siding with the Protestants. Parliament passed two important acts that year in relation to the Church. The first reintroduced the royal supremacy. However, unlike her father and her brother, she was titled of Supreme Head. Instead, she was named Supreme Governor, which had a more moderate tone that was less objectionable than the previous title. The next act was the Act of Uniformity that established the authorized form of worship of the Church. Some sources point to Elizabeth's wish to use the prayer book of 1549, which was considered closer to the pre-Reformation liturgies than the prayer book of 1552. However, many Protestants felt that the second book was still too Catholic and wanted much further reforms like those seen in Switzerland. Thus, any hopes of using the first prayer book as a compromise with Catholics were dashed. The 1559 Book of Common Prayer was a slightly altered version of the one approved in 1552. However, several small changes in the rubrics were made, such as allowing priests to use vestments that were in use in 1548 while the liturgy was still in Latin, required the clergy to use the sign of the cross during baptism, and required the faithful to kneel while receiving Holy Communion. It also allowed altars to be used and candles to be placed on them. The result was an uncomfortable acceptance by many. Many of the bishops put in place by Mary did not accept the religious settlement. Elizabeth had all but one of them deprived of their sees, and replaced them with bishops whom themselves had been deprived by Mary while she had been queen. The same day that Mary had died, the Archbishop of Canterbury, Reginald Cardinal Pole, had passed away as well. Thus, the position of Archbishop of Canterbury was vacant. In August, Elizabeth chose Matthew Parker, whom had previously been a chaplain to her mother, Anne Boleyn. Parker was considered a moderate among the Protestants. One problem arose was in having Parker consecrated as a bishop. Although Protestant, Elizabeth and her supporters still held a belief in apostolic succession with its historic episcopate. Traditionally, a new bishop would be ordained and consecrated by at least three bishops. However, Elizabeth had deprived the bishops installed by Mary, and none of them were willing to perform the episcopal consecration. Eventually, four Protestant bishops, who had been deprived of their positions, agreed to conduct Parker's consecration. On the 19th of December, 1559, in the chapel of Lambeth Palace, Matthew Parker was consecrated by William Barlow, Miles Cloverdale, John Hodgkins, and John Scurry, with Barlow acting as the principal consecrator. For the service, they used an ordinal produced by Thomas Cramner in 1550, which had been viewed by Rome as being inadequate. Years later, a false account of the consecration sprang about that stated that Parker had not been subject to any ordinal at all, but instead had had a Bible placed in his head and simply declared a bishop by Barlow whilst in a public house called the Nag's Head. 
Before the death of King Edward VI in 1553, then-Archbishop Cranmer had prepared 42 articles he believed summarized the doctrine of the Church of England. However, before these articles had become legally binding, Mary had come to the throne and prevented their enactment. In 1559, Archbishop Matthew Parker had the Church Convocation reevaluate these articles, which had been reduced to 39. The 39 Articles of Religion, as they came to be called, established the unique doctrines and positions that the Church of England held in respect to other Protestants and the Roman Catholics. The Articles firmly established the Catholic nature of the Church of England by reaffirming Trinitarianism of the Church, supporting the concept of the Howering of Hell, establishing the Apostles, Nicene, and Athanasian creeds as essential parts of belief, declared the authority of the ecumenical councils, and gave support to hierarchical ministry. At the same time, the Articles also established the Protestant or Reformed aspect of the Church of England by attacking the Roman doctrine of purgatory, supporting the use of the vernacular in services, spoke against belief in transubstantiation, stated that both bread and wine were to be received by the faithful in the Eucharist, and allowed for priests to be married. However, these articles also set the Church of England apart from the other Protestants in a few areas, such as establishing the secondary canonical nature of the books of the Apocrypha, implicit rejection of the doctrine of sola scriptura, attacking radical positions of common ownership of property, and the refusal to swear oaths. These articles of religion were not part of a confession of faith, as the Augsburg's Confession of 1532 is to Lutheranism, or the Westminster Confession of Faith is to Calvinists. Elizabeth proved all but one of these 39 articles that stated the doctrines of the Church of England. The result presented the Church of England as a via media, or middle way between Roman Catholicism and radical Protestants. The missing article, number 29, was added back into the list in 1570, after the Pope had formally excommunicated Elizabeth. John Jewell, the Bishop of Salisbury, was a prestigious Anglican theologian and writer. In 1562, he released the Apologia Ecclesiastica Anglicaniae, or Apology of the Church of England. This defense of the Church of England and her doctrines was penned in Latin and not English, as it was meant to be read by Roman Catholics and Protestants alike living in continental Europe. Jewell, along with others, also took Cramner's Book of Homilies, revised and lengthened it to a list of 21 sermons to be preached to the people on the doctrines of the Church. Throughout Elizabeth's reign, many Protestants had attempted to curtail the religious settlement of 1559. For example, in 1572, there was an attempt in Parliament to empower bishops to allow portions of rites to be skipped as to lengthen the sermon. As well, it would have allowed parishes the ability to use the liturgies of Dutch and French Protestants living of England, whom were allowed to use the liturgies of their homeland. In the 1580s, several attempts were made to allow English translations of the liturgies used in Geneva. These attempts were stopped primarily because it became clear that Elizabeth found her displeasure with them. During Elizabeth's reign, the English began to explore past Europe. Sometime in late 1578, the first Anglican Communion service was carried out in North America. Martin Frobisher's expedition of 1578 had with it a chaplain named Robert Wolfall. He conducted it in Frobisher Bay, off the coast of Baffin Island in present-day Nunavut, Canada. The exact date and location is unknown, but is commemorated on the 3rd of September by the Anglican Church of Canada. The first recorded Anglican Communion service in what is now the United States was carried out on the 19th of June, 1579, somewhere near San Francisco, California. During Elizabeth's reign, Catholics within England and Europe had always hoped for England to return to the papal fold. The most arguable closest attempt made to restore Catholicism during Elizabeth's reign was in 1588. Elizabeth's brother-in-law, King Philip II of Spain, who had himself been the King Consort of England, sent a large fleet of Spanish warships. They were to link up and transport the Spanish army of 30,000 men in the Netherlands that had been fighting the Dutch Protestants. England would have been easily overrun had it not been for the skill of the sailors of England's Royal Navy 
and the favorable Protestant winds. The Spanish Armada was forced to limp back home sailing around Scotland and Ireland. Spain was heavily indebted after the failed expedition, and England was finally able to begin her own empire. Elizabeth's long and relatively stable reign meant that the via media of the English Reformation became a lasting norm as opposed to the changes made by her brother and sister. English Catholics hoping for Elizabeth's demise and for a Catholic to return to the throne of England was never seen, and by the beginning of the 17th century was now a small underground group. Conversely, a growing number of Protestants called the Puritans had their hopes dashed for much further reforms. The hope of the Puritans lie in James VI, the King of Scots, and Elizabeth's heir. Scotland had adopted Presbyterianism and had sided with the Calvinists of Geneva on most matters of the Reformation. In 1603, Elizabeth died. She left England as a major power in Europe and a church in a unique position as being both Catholic and Protestant. England awaited its new king to arrive, and the Puritans awaited the coming reforms they had so long hoped for that had never transpired under Elizabeth. Little did they know that the new king would find the situation in England much more to his liking than the one he had in Scotland.